Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Anna Gatman, who describes herself as a catalyst of transformation. And one of the reasons why I love that is because I do believe that certain people, one of their life purposes on this earth plane at this time is to help others to change, to transform, to grow, to elevate, to expand, to explore, to live a life that's fulfilling and helpful. And she spent the last couple of decades on what she calls an inner quest into how the world works, how she works, and the nature of reality as such, because reality is subjective. But I think if we can all come from a space where we know what we think and believe, it can be easier to open up to what others may think and believe. I do find that a lot of conflict or delusion, disillusion, and perhaps uh, some irony as well, it, because it is ironic, comes from when we're in turbulent times or we're in difficult times, but we also find it difficult to open up to what others may think and feel. Anna was born in Israel, but she currently lives in the US. And she had a very uh, difficult upbringing. And um, she also had a stutter as well when she was younger. So she had undiagnosed uh, learning challenges, learning difficulties. And these things can go undiagnosed. And um, I think it's just recently really where the emphasis has been on becoming more aware of how children behave or, or act or, or uh, present and how rather than just concentrating on how they perform at school. Although that's an indicator as well that there could be difficulties, but a lot of the difficulties start with emotional difficulties. And Anna also had very low self-esteem. And I think at some point in all of our lives, we've felt those things, be it peer pressure or sibling issues or even parental issues, extended family issues. But she has worked to get to the place where she's been able to shift and change. But Anna had a very interesting career as a fashion model, a top fashion model. Anna modeled for Yves Saint Laurent, Jean-Paul Gaultier, and many other people, many other designers. And she appeared in a lot of fashion, uh, prominent fashion magazines. And a lot of her work is out there. I will post a couple of pictures of her now that you can see. And she was in a lot of print. She did a lot of print work and catwalk and everything. High in high, very high demand. In very high demand. And you know, sometimes when we get to that space. Um, purely based upon what's biological, you know, how you may look, how you may sound, how you may present, which is biological. Some things are learned, even in her business of catwalk uh, or of modeling, she would have learned certain things. But it, if she hadn't been born the way she's born, those opportunities wouldn't present themselves. So that's a whole different show for a different day, which I will approach. But it's very interesting how whatever position we're spaced or placed, in which we're spaced or placed, we are offered the opportunity to accept, reject, um, to explore. And if you're up for the challenge, you may take it. And if not, perhaps not. But Anna is going to speak about that. We had such a great conversation about spirituality, about all her, of her practices, how she transformed, how she's helping others to do so as well. She talks a lot about the training she has. Uh, I mentioned she has a PhD, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, she's got a lovely family. She's just uh, an amazing woman who's had an amazing life and continues to live a life that is extraordinary. And she is a prime example of, you know, sometimes you just never know from where you start 
you know, in that family you're born into with those people that you didn't choose. I know spiritualists believe we do choose our families, but for the purposes of this intro, <laughs> just for now, um, but that family you didn't choose as such, you find ways to persevere and to fly above. And that's why I started this podcast, just to talk to people about how they manage to fly above things, not rise, but fly, because you can rise above something, but then you've got to move forward. So flying is the process of movement. You're not flying, you're not moving unless you're flying. So flying above, I chose the word for a reason. And flying above things helps. It helps with your progression. And in doing so, it can help others. So I did a podcast about life purpose. Uh, what, what is our calling? And sometimes I believe it starts when we're quite young. And again, I do believe there isn't just one life purpose. And I think people get tripped up because of that belief or idea that you have to have a purpose. I think we have many incarnations in this lifetime on this earth plane. And at one time, Anna was a top fashion model who was in high demand and it literally fell into her lap, literally. And she'll tell you about that. It's extraordinary how this happens. Um, but tell me what you think. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. Is is this divine intervention? Is it the calling? How would you describe it? How would you define it? Because there's so many, I suppose, definitions or ideas about what things are. Is that synchronicity? Is it, is it a combination of all of them? Is it God intervening? Is it the universe? What are your thoughts about how and why things seem to or appear to just fall into people's laps based upon how they look. Uh, someone else was telling me about when I was telling them I was going to interview Anna, they were talking about a male model, uh, Jordan Barrett, that's right, how it kind of just fell into his lap as well. It just People have a certain presence, a certain look, and if it's right for that day, for that purpose, again, purpose comes in, then I believe you draw it to you and it's drawn to you and other people are drawn to you. And that happens for a lot of people, for a lot of things. For me, I've always had some great people around me uh, who have championed me. And I would say mentor. I've, I've had two prominent, well, three really prominent mentors in my life. Um, one of them was Eddie Callahan, Ms. Mrs. Eddie Callahan, and uh, the other was Percy Savage, who uh, who taught me at fashion school. He was a protege of Yves Saint Laurent, and um, Yves Saint Laurent named Au Sauvage, uh, you know, as a homage to him. And Percy was an amazing man amazing man i'll put a picture of us but he was he was always um championing me pushing me out to the front telling me that i was going to do the um the commentating for fashion shows he took me to these amazing clubs in london all hidden you you just wouldn't know they existed private clubs i can't say the names of them some of them i don't remember what they're called and and actually a lot of them didn't have a name. They just, we were walking down particular streets and we walked down steps and suddenly you were in a whole new world of glamour, fashion, um, people, you you know, royalty and all sorts of people. It was just incredible. And Percy took me into that world and that was just, for some reason, he was drawn to me and I'm forever grateful I keep saying I'm going to do an homage to him or a podcast about him. Um, and I, 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 well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe perhaps I will. He's very well known. Um, he did pass away not long ago. Well, a, a while ago, actually. He did pass away a while ago. And Eddie did too. Eddie Callahan uh, 
well, a New Yorker, a loud, brash, <laughs> fantastic New Yorker who was in London, saw me one day and said, what's your name? I said, Shah. So she called me Shah, Shah, Shah in a very New York way. Um, wonderful lady. She she immediately said, no, you need to you need to be in management. You need to be running things. You need to be, uh, you know, this is, anyway, she, again, a mentor literally took me from being um, in certain place in sales to being in top management. And of course it was my hard work that helped and that's what she spotted. However, if it weren't for her, pointing it out to her managers then you know the bosses the, the bosses in New York and this was in London but there were bosses in New York um then it would never well I don't know if it never happened but it wouldn't have happened that way and I do miss her dearly we were in, she would <laughs> she would come over to London four or five times a year we'd have a ball we would go to our favorite spots and it was just incredible incredible woman i was exhausted every time i saw her um and and it was a good exhaustion because she was just full of life full of stories full of her life and everything she had moved to rhode island um and had a beautiful cottage there and yes so i miss eddie and then i have another mentor who yeah, I'm not going to go into, but another mentor in my life who's still alive, actually. But one one of the things that I like with Anna is when we talk a little bit about that, about did you consult people? Did you have, you know, because I was always one that would ring people up and say, you know what, this is happening. What do you think? I like to know what people think. It doesn't mean I'm going to follow what they say, but I'm quite open to hearing people what people think. And some people can't bear that. But my approach has always been, look, I, I'll, I'll listen if you're offering or if I'm asking, I will listen. But it doesn't mean I'm going to take your advice or do what you suggest. It means that I'm going to gather the information and then make an informed decision based upon me and the, consequ and the consequences as well. And they'll be down to me, not you. And be it good or not so good. <laughs> but I learned that, I don't know how, I, I think I learned it at home, um, just getting feedback and asking. I think because I certainly went into my work world doing that. Um, the thing is, sometimes if you're very good at what you do as well, and you work for other people, or you work with other people, work for other people, Sometimes people higher ups will not want you to progress because they may feel threatened. They may feel inferior because of your experience, your knowledge. And actually, I'm going to I'm interviewing someone about that uh, later this month. And I think the podcast will air sometime in July. But we've, I've got something lined up and this person's an expert in this area. and. Um, so we'll, <laughs> it'll be interesting to talk about that and to see the expertise and get that background because a lot of people do uh, have that and you have to make decisions about how you're going to move through that. But for Anna, she, for her, she just had this thing, you know, it was her looks, it was her height, of course, and it was her way because let's i mean i worked in fashion and i did have a stint as a model <laughs> blink and you would have missed it but um i sneeze you would have cough anything a qu any quick action you would have missed it <laughs> but it was fun it was fun it for me it was just fun i was asked to do it it was fun 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 friends came out everybody came out um and i do know that people just don't ask you for no reason for me, it was my hair. They wanted me to model my hair. That's how it started. And I do remember at the time I was into New Wave and into New Romantics, and I had dyed a section of the back of my hair green. Now, that was kind of unheard of way back in the 80s. 
especially in black hair salons and things. It just wasn't done. So I went to this hair salon and San Francisco as well. And they said, oh, my goodness, this is interesting. And so anyway, they said, oh, you know, fantastic. And then can you be in the show? Can you be? You've got such thick, long hair. Can you be in the show? <laughs> so I said, OK, fine. Um, and it wasn't even modeling hair. So I that was odd. But anyway. And so, yes, I did that. But then I went back a couple of weeks later to, ha to have my hair done again. And when I walked in, everybody had color in the, in the back of their hair. <laughs> everybody had copied it. It was so funny. And they said, oh, it's because of you. See what you've done. So that was hilarious. But these things do fall into our lap. She's lived a life. So, oh, gosh, I feel like I've gone down. I'm exhausted as well. I feel like I've gone down some kind of memory lane or it might be a crazy lane as well. I don't know. But anyway, I'm glad I have memory still. And I'm glad I'm able to remember some of those things. Everybody tells me, you remember every little thing. Well, no, actually, I don't. There's many, or many occasions. You only need to ask a couple of people around me. Many occasions, definitely, I don't remember anything. Julianne, who does a lot of my, uh, the admin and bookings and stuff, she will say, remember I told you, and I don't. And we often argued. I'm saying, Julianne, you did not. I'm sure you did not. And she'll pull up the email I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> but so now I so now I accept that. Yeah, she's she's pretty much going to be right all the time. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, but that's what friends are for. Oh, she's actually a family member. So but that's what friends are for. And that's what people do. So I'm I'm rambling ramble on i'm rambling on um yeah i'm rambling on i want to start singing ramble on by led zeppelin but i won't do that okay so i'm rambling on now so i'm going to let's welcome <laughs> let's welcome let's welcome anna to the show so anna thank you so much for joining me today it's lovely to see you Hello, Sha. I'm so excited to be on your show and talk about all spiritual matters and how to live in these crazy times that we are living through huh? and how to find your way through it. Tell me about it, Anna. Tell me. There's so much going on. But, you know, I've, I've got a lot to ask you about today. You've done so much work. And Anna, you have had a life and you are really living a life. You've had such an interesting journey and you continue to do so. But I want to ask you about um, the past few years and how you came to start to think about this shift, a transformational shift. You refer to it as a shift calling, which I love. Right. Yes. So how did that come about? What was happening for you at the time? So I'll, I'll say this. I, I so. so you're referring to my um, upcoming book, which yes. is going to come out in a, in a month or so, called Shift Calling. And what I realized is that we each have a shift calling us. And I'll get to my story in a second. I just want to create a um, context for it. And sometimes it's the hardest thing that we're suffering the most. And the thing that we are suffering the most is the biggest shift calling us. And so rather than feeling that we are doomed or forsaken or it's never going to change for me it's happening for everybody else but not for me i'm inviting people to look at the sh at the shift calling us that it's actually a shift it's our biggest ally because that's where we're the most stuck where the flow of of divine consciousness cannot come through because it's stuck we're not doing it on purpose life circumstances whatever um but there's a shift that's calling us and it seems like it's all stuck. But if we see it as our ally and start dialoguing with it, then we can have a big, profound transformation. And I feel that that's also what is happening globally. The same thing. There's a shift calling to awaken. If you don't awaken, you're going to be crushed. You're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel anxious. But if you listen to the shift and just walk through over to the, the 
on the bridge to the other side, the narrow bridge, you will have a magnificent, profound, fulfilling life. So that's kind of the context of it. And I'll say for me, the shift started, the first shift that I noticed really started this, happened when I was 18 years old, so quite a long time ago. And it was, I grew up in an alcoholic family, alcoholic mother, raging father. I had a stutter, a severe stutter, um, red hair, freckles, white skin, which was not popular at the time and not in Israel where I grew up, where everybody's more tan. Um, and so I had big issues of low self-esteem, self-hatred, undiagnosed learning challenges. I mean, the whole list. And I was visiting my mom who had separated from my dad. She was living in Sweden where she's from. I'm originally from Israel. And in the pharmacy, I was sitting with a big sweater hiding myself, you know, like a bushy hair. And someone reached out to me and said, do you want to travel the world and work as a fashion model? Now that's a shift calling. <laughs> when you're coming from that place of self-hatred, self-loathing, really self-loathing. Um, so clearly she could see something in me that itself. But and it took me two months of deliberation because in Israel, women are due in, it's mandatory to go into the military service. So your listener might go, well, I could go into the military service. I could go to, to Paris to be a fashion model. Da, no. But it was a big shift. And that's what shifts are. They Many times they be, require us to have courage because, because it's mandatory, because I had been brainwashed that you live in a country, you get benefits, you have duties to your country, we have to fight for the country. My dad was in the Air Force, so it was prestigious. I mean, I thought I would lose my friends, my family. So it was a big decision to do what today would seem obvious. Well, of course, you should go to Paris. Mm. I didn't know the language. I was 18 years old. I'd had stories about women being kidnapped. I mean, it, it wasn't rosy like you might think it is. And I decided to take the leap and give it a chance. And the reason I did that is because I felt an expansiveness, an expansiveness in my heart, an excitement. So an expansiveness is like an excitement that comes to every, everyone has felt it. You feel it when you see a sunset, you feel it when you hear music that you love. You uh, feel it when you see a child and your heart opens or a pet that you love, or when you're engaged with something that you love doing, you're passionate about and time just runs by and you're working away and you love it. We feel this expansious heart tingling in our bodies, um, heightened awareness. I felt that and that felt really, really good. It just felt good. And so that became my guide from then onwards to, oh, it's time to shift because I'm feeling that feeling again. Because the result was that I went to Paris. I got to be on the cover of 16 magazine after two and a half weeks and never looked back and never went back to do my military service um, and had a very successful career in Europe. And I was in New York for two years as well. Um, but that feeling of expansiveness of spaciousness, of something better, something that promises something good for me that I deserve. That feeling, there's something, something loving that is calling me, calling me, luring me. That was the feeling. And I'm describing it so that everyone can, can go, oh, I, I can relate to this or I can relate to that. Yes, I, I've had that too. And so... That was the original shift calling me. Um, I think that the shift that happened now around COVID was, you know, it's the first time that the entire world, the entire humanity has had a shared experience. Everyone knows where, where they were when lockdown happened. It's quite incredible for humanity to have a shared experience because we live so much in divisiveness. So to have a shared experience where we all know someone who 
we have lost someone dear to us. We know someone who, who has lost someone dear. Many of us dropped our loved ones in the emergency room and never saw them again because we were not allowed in. They were not allowed out. So we've all gone through a trauma, but a lot of heart and a lot of loving and a lot of caring for each other. So that became my, my, my big shift now. It's like, okay, now I need to use all the tools that I have and I've already used to help others do the same shift to a more expansive, enlightened place of joy, of fulfillment. And I'll just say one more thing. It's not a one direction thing. You get there, arrived, done. <laughs> As you know, it's a daily practice. It's a daily practice, but it gets easier. You, get, you, you come out of the funk faster, but it still shows up. But you're, you have the tools to get out of it quicker, faster, um, and you start going more and more towards this butterflies in the stomach or tingling, whatever you have that gives you this, oh, there's, there's a love that's drawing me into a better life, towards a better life. So... That's how I end up here with you. It's incredible. And I suppose we can see divine intervention in some way because we don't know what life would have been like if that huge change and shift hadn't yeah. happened to you at that time. Right. You know, just going into adulthood. Yeah. And what I've seen, because I feel there are people who... So everyone's fighting a battle we know nothing about, right? Everyone's fighting a battle we know nothing about. But when we judge people from the outside, we go, oh, they, they were lucky. They're beautiful. They're rich. They're lucky. They have a relationship. They have a career. But everyone gets opportunities. And the question is, are you, you going to take them? And when we are too scared to take them, I find that people are more invested in staying in a, in a place that's familiar, even if it's awful, even if it just keeps telling us that we're worthless. We stay there because we feel like the unknown is scary. And the reframe is, the shift is, the unknown is exciting. That's where you get to, all the dreams, we're all dreaming. All the time, we want those shoes. We want, we we want to travel. We want another child. We want a pet. We we're all desiring all the time more love in the forms of all of these material things, right? And so, really, it's about having the tools to be a bit less scared, have the courage, reframe. Um, the unknown is scary. And see it as that's where I get to paint my own painting. And, you know, the canvas is there and I get to do what I want. And it takes, you know, people like you to support people like that. And all of us to, to support us all, right? To, to have more courage and to feel less afraid to take this leap of faith, but go towards a life of more love. At the end of it, it's more self-love and more love for the world that we live in. And such a good point and very well put. And it brings up a query though. Was there anyone you could consult at that time? Did you talk to friends to say, look, this opportunity's flopped into my lap out of nowhere, what should I do? Or was it all self referred as such? Did you refer to yeah. yourself for the decision? Yeah. We don't live in, in uh, isolation. We live in connection. We're born into connection. Um, we grow through connection. We heal through connection. We make decisions through through it. So um, it, it it is really important to consult with others, ask for help. I know it's against the culture many times. Different culture has you know like going to psychotherapy is like look down at you might be mentally sick or you have a problem instead of. You're just going for help to make it to the next level of a better life for yourself. That's, I mean, that's what you offer, right? Yes. So, 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 um, 
I definitely consulted with others. I mean, I still tortured back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on every decision, the, the, the modeling decision to go to Paris for two months, I deliberated because I was going against my father. Oh. So that felt like a huge thing, but very symbolic because you could say going against patriarchy, going against um, rational thinking versus intuitive thinking. Um, so it was very symbolic in a sense. I mean, he was a caring father who was afraid that I'd be one of those women who would be kidnapped and he'd never see me again. And he was also very domineering. So he wanted to decide what my destiny would be. He was a pilot. He wanted me to be an air hostess. I mean, he had it all planned out for me. So, but it really is, we're all shifting internally, but we're also elevating humanity because we, we shift from patriarchy, from sexism, from racism, from capitalism, from many things that really oppress us from living by listening, you know, to these whispers of love that are asking us to become a better version of ourselves, a more whole version of ourselves. So it, it, it demands talking to others, but here is the thing. Also talking to others that are not your common human being, that means having, so, so there's a principle in my upcoming book, which is synergy. It's like physical and non-physical synergy. Some people will call it, you know, I talk to angels, I talk to my grandmother who's passed away, but... I'm talking to my uncon or, or subconscious, but having conversations with the world, seen and unseen, outer world and inner world, um, in order to get advice for the right direction to go. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so whatever someone is wanting to, to do a shift they want to make, um, I mean, let's just take something simple around my body, right? If I want to lose weight, start a conversation with your body. Start a conversation with your hips. Start a conversation with your chest or your belly. <clears throat> you know, put your hands on your belly. It's like it's an, an expansive, again, I was talking about the expansive sense. Having a conversation with your belly is an expansive perspective of having a relationship with your body of what would be right for it. Maybe some soft massaging, maybe caressing, maybe having meditations that, to soften your belly. Um, maybe it's a gym uh, subscription to the gym. Maybe it's something, but maybe it's something internal. Maybe there's emotions there that need to, to be released. Start talking to the whole world. See everything is alive and start talking with everything, with everyone seen and unseen, human and not human, and the world will start talking back to you and your intuition will start to guide you. In a sense, the, the universe is waiting for you to communicate with it. And so that's what I did. And, and still I, I struggle each time there's a shift, right? Because we, and the struggle is part of it. It becomes like we're going back and forth. Does it feel right? Does it not feel right? So... Yeah. hope that, it answers that yes oh absolutely very interesting so you did consult people yes you know, i don't know I, I i believe it's always been the case a lot of people live very solitary isolating lives and especially people who come from trauma yeah. families where there was trauma because they feel as though it's safer somehow to be on their own yeah. and so it's important to talk to people, absolutely. But as you've rightly said, and, and as you put it, it's also important to connect with your spiritual or whoever, whatever it is for you, that spiritual. Yeah. And, yeah. and that brings me... It, yes, it, okay. Can I just say, so, so even in, in a more playful way, even when you get dressed in the morning, have a conversation with your clothes, mm -hmm. with your outfit. Do you think I should wear you today? Is this, you know, I'm going to this meeting, I'm, or, or I want to feel, I, I want to feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be writing today, and I want to really stay focused. Do you feel, no, 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 you're, you're too energetic. I need you for this other meeting. You're, oh, you're calming, you're soothing. You remind me of dot, 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 dot. 
everything is alive and everything can have a conversation with. So even if you are living in isolation, start feeling that you live in an interdependent world and, and, and an interconnected world. I mean, that is the, the, the biggest thing for us to realize that we live in an interdependent, interconnected world and start talking. You're not crazy if you start talking to your outfits of what to wear to feel in a certain mood and be at your best. And you get answers from your subconscious, you know, from your outfit. It's, it's like, it, it's from the field. It's not like the dress is talking to you. The field of the relationship between your outfit and what's right for you for your meeting or for your day is informing you of what's, what would create mo most wholeness and joy for you or the optimal conditions for you. So wow. do that. If you're alone, then start talking to 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 the objects in your house i love it i love that that's fantastic i totally agree i think color as well informs up there's an energy with color so uh, yes yeah, so should i wear brown so should i wear yellow today you yeah. resonate with it and yeah oh fantastic stuff and speaking of you know i suppose expanding your consciousness and that yeah. something that i know you're very interested in and that you yes with. and you know for for centuries um philosophers everybody's been talking about how to expand your consciousness i recently did a video on what makes you spiritual and i talked a bit about the counterculture the 60s the 70s where psychedelics were huge and the maharishi was you know so people yeah. have have looked to all things in all ways to expand yeah. their consciousness. For me, meditation does that. Yoga mm. does that. A walk, a nice. horse does yeah. that. Yeah. But for every, but to each his own. I'm certainly not yeah. um, judging or downing the use of whatever. Yeah. You use. But I wanted to ask you, how does expanding your consciousness help? How how does it help people? In what way? Yeah, yeah. So imagine I'll, I'll explain from 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 a, from, a few, from a few directions. So imagine if you're looking at a problem. Oh, I I'm, I realize that we're we're gonna be on audio and not video. So I'm showing it oh, with my hands. Video as well. It's audio and oh video. oh, it's audio and video. Okay, good. So so if, if you have a narrow view. You're looking at a problem that you're dealing with and you have a very um, narrow span of information. You might have one choice or you might feel like you have no choices. If you expand the scope of the possibilities, now you're looking at a larger scope. Suddenly you might have two or three options, right? Suddenly your field of information is wider you have more information, more information means more combinations, therefore more solutions, more creative, empowering solutions. That's a simple way of saying it. Um, another way is if you look at your smartphone and on, on, uh, you're driving in your car, your GPS, it just shows you take right in 20 feet or take left in. If you look at an old um, cart, like a map of a city, then suddenly you see, oh my God, I could come from where I am to where I want to go. There are three or five different ways. Okay, I need to drop off my laundry and I want to take a walk. So I'll go left here, right here. Suddenly you have many, many choices. So expanding our field of view expands our field of information and therefore our field of creative empowering solutions. Um, so, so now when we're doing it with our experience, with, with our body, with our being, we're expanding our consciousness, we're expanding our field of awareness, it becomes more subtle into everything else that is in our field. It's not rational, so it's not like you're aware of all the connections. There's a multi multitude, endless multitude of connections. But once we expand and we are more attentive to everything so for example you ask a question and then you just have this as an inquiry what do i do about this and just leave it rather than trying to figure it out logically this 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 just ask it as an inquiry to the universe 
to your higher self, your inner, you know, divine being. And then you just stay open. You actually relax more rather than effort more mm -hmm. into listening and then go about your day. The universe, all these different connections start coming in and, and informing you of how to solve this problem. And then suddenly you have this gut feeling, inner knowing, intuitive knowing, hunch. You don't know where it came from. It shows up like a flash of light suddenly in its totality. And it's like, why didn't I think of that before? But that's what happens when we expand our consciousness. We just enlarge the field of information and therefore the field of possibility. And again, when we do it with our being, our body becomes more spacious. Our body becomes more spacious. Our breathing becomes more deep, more calm. We feel better. All the biochemicals in our body begin to, you know, the endorphins, everything begins to feel more spacious, more calm, more loving. And the, the more we grow our consciousness and expand it, the more the more we feel that the world is part of us rather than just me here, suddenly a child suffering on the other side of the planet is like my child. So the, the, the solution in a sense to world problems is to expand our consciousness. If I'm in a conflict in my relationship with a friend or a, a romantic relationship, if I can expand my perspective and start seeing it from their perspective and they can see from my perspective, we're, we're more likely to find a good solution, right? Than if I just see it from my perspective and I'm just going to fight for my position because I'm right. But if I expand it and say, I want my needs to be met, but I also want to hear your needs. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, oh, well, I don't have a conflict with your need. I just want my need to be met as well. Where there, there, there are 10 ways, at least, of how to solve a need. A, a position, an opinion, we're going to get into, in, into conflict. But if we expand from position to need, I'd love to solve your needs. I'll feel more happy if your needs are met. And many times when your needs are met, my needs can be met as well right? Because many times we have common needs or we can, our needs can be met, but not at the same time. So, so in different ways. So from all directions, when we expand our perspective, we see the humanity of everybody. We see our own humanity. We are in awe of nature suddenly. Um, the, the, we care for the world. The world becomes a part of us and we become a part of the entire world. And then if we harm the world, we're harming ourselves. If we don't care about what's happening in the world, we're not caring for us. We might not feel the results immediately. We might be privileged, but it is, we are all paying a toll, a toll, a, a toll, right? A toll in English. Yes. Yeah. So, and we see in COVID, we saw how we all paid a huge price. So, so that's why I, for, for me, ex expanding our consciousness and opening up to a larger view, whether it's intuitive or it's in relationship, is going to allow us to have a more compassionate, understanding, creative, um, holistic solution that is going to be life affirming and it's going to be a win-win for everyone involved. So that's why I, I am pro a proponent of expanding our consciousness. And we do it by walking in the forest or, as you said, people use plant medicine, which has been used, you know, by indigenous people for ever. There's different places. And the reason people are looking for that, teenagers are looking, you know, for drugs. It's like there's a code in our soul that remembers where we came from. And where we came from, we were in this expansive, really love light. And I'm not saying it, oh, we're all love, we're all light. It's like, it really is this substance that the universe is made of. I mean, look what an amazing planet we live on. Just look at a flower or look at your muscle, you know, at your hand and what you're capable of doing or 
all of civilization has been created from e from everything in in civilization is created from what's grown above soil and underneath soil. Nothing has been shipped in from anywhere. Isn't that amazing? I mean, there's a lot of degrees of separation between soil and your smartphone, but <laughs> it originates from above soil or below soil. So if you have this expansive perspective, or if you see yourself as you're breathing, is receiving oxygen from plant kingdom, from the trees, and you emitting CO2 as you exhale, you're giving substance sustenance to the trees. Suddenly you have this expansive perspective of a relationship with trees. You're going to care for trees more and not just want to, oh, who cares if trees, we, we don't need to trees. They just create fires. Or suddenly you have a very different perspective about the world. So that's why the expansive principle for me is at the core of um, becoming the optimal that we can be and the wholeness that humanity can be. Yes, the wholeness and that connectivity. Yes. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. It really is a nice lead into something that you talk about as well, which is that um, in, in my own words, the way I understand it, what you're saying is that, you know, the spiritual and the material are congruent. They're not separate. Yeah. They exist right. together. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I watched your TED Talk, which was fantastic. And I do want to say congratulations for doing that. Um, I think anybody who does a TED Talk needs to be given flowers, a free meal, <laughs> a big <laughs> <laughs> Who does a TED Talk? I my hat is off to you. That was wonderful. So I, I'm so, going to link to the TED Talk in the show notes. Yes. So 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 it was a TEDx talk, and indeed it was about that. It was you can eat your cake and have enlightenment too. You can be spiritually enlightened and enjoy the material world because they are connected. They are united. So first of all, everything is energy in the world, but it's not just energy, it's intelligent energy. So it's consciousness. And so, and so everything that becomes material is an expression of a particular consciousness. So a particular pattern of flowers that repeats itself has um, a blueprint in the spiritual realms that slowly, slowly, comes into flesh and becomes a specific flower. And the same for humans. Humans are more individual, flowers are more like a collective pattern. But there's a collective pattern of being human as well. So everything is consciousness first, everything is in the spiritual, non-physical realm first. And quantum physics is, is, is showing that today. So science and mysticism are coming together and uniting in beautiful ways, kind of proving that what mystics have experienced throughout the ages, right? So the, 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 the best example I have for how congruence, the physical and non-physical or spiritual and physical <clears throat> realms are is if you go to a retreat center and there's, um, there's a um, peaceful corner with water, coming down, trickling, a be beautiful sound. There's a bench, there's some plants. There's, you, you sit down there and people are attracted to it. There's peacefulness, there's spaciousness. The people who designed that in the center did it on purpose. They didn't have TV with latest basketball and football screening there, right? They didn't want that. They wanted there to be water. They wanted the elements to be there, the earth to be there, to be color of flowers, maybe a peaceful bench you could hear. So they're designing the spiritual, the spiritual experience they want us to have through the material, physical garden they are creating. That's what they're doing. They want peacefulness. They want spacefulness. They want time out. 
They want our minds to stop, our breathing to become deeper. So they create a space like that. I think everybody can relate to a garden like that. Um, likewise, it's for the, if, if you work in a corporation, the spreadsheet that you create, the spreadsheet that the accountant does, it's not just crunching numbers. You see, there's a hidden world to all the material world. It, they're creating tranquility in the business. They're creating order in the business. Um, they're creating congruency in the business. They're creating opportunity for a future investment, maybe, or for stopping to take a break. If the accountant was treated like that, and if the accountant saw themselves as when I create a spreadsheet, I'm bringing peacefulness, order, tranquility, possibility to a company, the accountant would become a spiritual teacher, right? Absolutely. So everything we do from going to a park to doing a spreadsheet, if we look at the hidden world, we're all looking for that hidden world. It is in everything material. When you buy a pair of shoes or you buy two pairs of shoes, you're buying it for different things that it satisfies in you. And if you're not aware of those hidden things, the spiritual hidden things that it inspires in you, you just want another pair and another pair because you're wanting that thing, but you're not identifying it. But let's say that you worked really hard and you feel really proud of yourself. You, you got a raise and you say, I'm going to go and buy a pair of shoes. You're buying a pair of shoes because you're proud of yourself because you say, I did it. I really did it. I fought for this. I got this. I had, I was great in the meeting. I closed the deal or the project or whatever it is. Those are the qualities for which you go and say, I want a pair of shoes. As well as, you know, you love beauty or aesthetics, or you feel better when you're walking in those shoes, or you've been dreaming of them. And all of that inner world is there when you buy a pair of shoes. And if we connect to that inner world of why we're buying the shoes and what it gives us when we wear them, suddenly walking, we're walking with all these qualities. We're embodying all these qualities. And suddenly it's not just a pair of shoes and we're consuming. We're buying a material expression of all the qualities that I just explained and many more, whatever it is for you, in the pair of shoes. Imagine walking into a restaurant with his shoes and with every step you go, this is my self pride. This is my, I kicked ass. I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm saying like big things like that, but it's like self love, sensuality. I mean, all of these things are in those pair of shoes. And if you walk like that, you're walking on clouds. And it's not just another pair of shoes. And so I think it's important for, for wh whatever we do in the material world, whatever our occupation is, whatever we do, to look for the hidden magic in what we're creating and imbue what the products or services that we're offering with that spiritual magic, like it's so obvious in a peaceful garden in, in a retreat center. Wow. Does that so well well said and i know our listeners our viewers will gain from that because really what you're saying is every single thing that exists is connected it has a reason and when we connect to it the reasons with us as well there's a reason why we yes. versions or whatever it is but we need to look deeper and yeah. I think we often walk around unconsciously on autopilot and it's a survival yeah. method, I know. And and we, we were never taught this. I mean, yeah. I discovered this through through inner inquiry, you know, and I talk about it in my TEDx talk that I was I was in the English countryside. It's easy to see to see God there because <laughs> the English countryside is magnificent. Yeah. And I just looked out at the trees and the hills and I just had this download or this realization 
that nature lives in perfect wholeness and unity between the material qualities of green grass or dark trees or, you know, white cloud and the spiritual qualities of expansiveness, of beauty that we all experience in nature. And there's, you know, there's research coming out of Stanford and about nature, how, how significant it is for our spiritual balance, for our emotional balance, our mental sanity. And so, and then it was like, well, if nature is in perfect unity and balance between spirit and matter, so must we be. We are a part of nature. And so that began my journey into this, what I call the principle of spiritual material wholeness, that everything material is an expression of a unique consciousness that created it. And, you know, Marie Kondo, who uh, organizes, says, whatever you pick up in your hand, does it spark joy? Mm. If it doesn't, it shouldn't be there. So her motto is, does it spark joy? Mm. So it's the same thing. Yes, I if like it sparks that. joy, if, 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 if a cup of coffee in the morning sparks joy, because it remind, either it's your quiet moment before the hustle and bustle, or it's a cup that you got from mm -hmm. your parent. And so if you could think of your parent when you drink from that cup, suddenly you connect to love, connection, caring. Love, connection, caring. We're all looking for that. They're spiritual, emotional qualities. They're in your coffee cup. If that coffee cup evokes that for you. Wonderful. Yes. So that's how to look for it. So that's, that's how, how to, to look, look for it. it. But yes, please. Yeah. More love, more connection. Yes. More yes. love, more connection, more, more, more. That's what we yeah. need. And that brings yeah. me to your four keys to mm. um, the spiritual and material balance. Or how can we, because I know you, you're going to talk about that in your book. You've got two books. Though. You've got one that's already out. Right. And the four keys was the reason that I wrote the first book, oh, which, is spirit, yeah. which is living a spiritual life in a, in a material world. And so the four keys are from that book that's already out. And the new book, I don't speak about the four keys, but it's really about, so the new book is Shift Calling. And that is about, there are like many, many uh, suggestions of shifts, how to expand your perception of yourself, to a more loving self, more empowered self, to shift your perspective on any situation that you're in, to increase your probabilities for transformation. So that's what Shift Calling is focused on. But the four keys were from, from the first book. Um, and, you know, it was part of what I, I, I discovered in my dissertation also. Um, so you, you really set the um our conversation really well because now everybody will understand the four keys they won't just sit there hanging because they've heard everything about the expansiveness because what i realized as part of my dissertation research that all spiritual experiences have this expansive quality that we've been talking about mm. and the more mystical our experience the more expansive it is the more we we, we have an experience that is an out-of-body experience in a sense and so, and this is your it felt and uh, this is your doctorate. Sorry, in right, yes. learning and education, right, changing right systems. Yes, yes, and yes, yes, yes. And so then it was like, okay, so the first key is to learn to expand our consciousness, and so expansive presence is the first key because it's opening up to a more enlightened self to a more enlightened us and that's th what happened to me when I was offered to be a fashion model but I had this duty to family and country and fear that I would lose both and yet there was this expansive presence of something else is calling you that's loving that, that's going to not put you down all, all, all the time and you know my, my family si situation was was really harsh so it was that against you'll be adored or you'll be loved or you'll be accepted or you will so so that was the expansive presence that made me want to go towards that uh so the first key is expansive presence and in my first book i do um i do give examples of expansive sensations in your body expansive emotions expansive 
thoughts and so cues for how to know that you're in an expansive st state. And we are all in it throughout the day, whether we are aware of it or not. So then the second key is once you're in this expansive state, now you've expanded your field of view, your intuitive field of view, you're more part of the wholeness of life and everything that's around you and your, and your life. So then attentive listening is key number two. And as I said before, it's not about efforting, it's about relaxing even more into, okay, let me listen now to what the universe is gonna bring me back through intuitive hunches, um, a miracle, a synchronistic event, we've all had that. So that's key number two. And then key number three is inspired action. Because once you get an intuitive hunch, then you want to act upon it. Oh, it's cool. I can't believe I was just talking to so-and-so. And then I saw this movie or this book showed up in the waiting room uh, when I was waiting at the bank or at the doctor. And it was just what I was talking about that I need. Well, now the inspired action is to take the book, read the book, or whatever you need to do in order to. So inspired action is important. Otherwise, we just stay in another meditation, another meditation, another meditation. And we also have to live in spiritual material wholeness. <clears throat> that's my stutter, that, my stutter that's almost gone, but every now and then it kind of shows up and I get stuck on a word. So I, I got stuck there. Um, so the action is important because you have an idea, you expanded. You got intuitive guidance as, as you were listening attentively. Key three, inspired action. So stay inspired. Do that uh, flow chart or crunch numbers, but stay inspired. I'm bringing order and tranquility to the business that I'm at. I'm not just crunching numbers and I wish I had a different job. You're bringing spiritual qualities, whatever you're doing. Just look for the hidden world and see see what you bring. And so then the fourth key is faith-filled knowing. And that's really, it's building your faith. The more you do this, the more you expand your consciousness, listen attentively, receive intuitive guidance, and act inspired. The more you build this faith-filled knowing that the universe is there to support you, that you're part of a web. You know, we say we're part of a web of life, but we really are. And you're part of the web of life that you live in and your listener is living, like each one. And so you start to realize, wow, I do this and the universe responds. I say I have to, I, how do I solve this? And a book shows up in the, in the waiting room. Um, you know, they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. That's another example of that. So you start the, building this faith-filled knowing of co-creation with your world, your subconscious, the universe, and everything just begins to simmer and sparkle and, and starts to happen for you because you've gotten into motion, but you've done it first by opening up, expanding spaciousness, listening attentively, then whenever you get a direction, you go with it, you act upon it, and then you start having this wondrous relationship with everything around you. That is so powerful. I really felt a strong energy around the third one as well. There's something about that that I feel people need to hear, not just me, <laughs> but people need to hear that. They really do. And I, I wow, it's very powerful. So, so the, the third one is inspired yeah. action. Inspired action to be Say sure. more. I mean, what? why do you feel people need to hear that? Because uh, something you said earlier in the interview was that there is a shift happening in the universe. And a few videos ago, I think it may have been season one, actually. I'm in my second season of the podcast. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the thread that connects us all. And I was talking a bit about spirituality and something channeled through me and said, there's a shift here. There's a huge shift mm -hmm. coming. And I just couldn't focus on the video. And I had to stop myself from channeling mm -hmm. whatever was coming through just to carry on with the video. 
So there's something about the shift being presented. If you, if, you know, it's like, here's your mission if you choose to take it. Right. <laughs> and so I, I feel that many people are going to take it. And that, yes. thank goodness, the internet now has opened us yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. And there's always that balance. It's, there's some good information out there and not so helpful information. Right, yeah. And, and I think that that is the key, you know, if we spoke earlier, it's like, how do we live through these times? It is by, it is by seeing the wonder because in the horror that's going on, and there is horror, heartless horror going on in the world, far away and also in our backyard. There's also wonder happening equally. Both, you know, the sun is rising every day. It's spring and it's bloom, and that hasn't changed. That is happening, and it's magnificent, and it's and it's wondrous. And there are grassroots organizations doing amazing work, and there are people who are loving whatever, if it's the bees or children or what all all you know, water, the wilderness, whatever it is. People are are um, sharing the love for a cause that's important for them. Just like, you know, you share what's important for you in this podcast and the videos that you do. And I share, you know, to sit and write a book for six months takes focus. I, I, I kind of stopped my life to do that. It comes from a deep love, a deep love for the world. And that hasn't gone away. Yes. And so the key is to pay attention what hasn't gone away, what is magnificent, what is wondrous, and to go for that, to amplify that. Because the more we amplify that, the more there will be that. The more we sit and complain or get anxious about the horrors that the news just feeds up, the media machine, the more we think that the world is, is, is going to pieces. And parts are. Many of the institutions are dying slowly, but they are. But new things are there all the time. And so likewise, in each one of your worlds it's if you focus on what is working and what is good and you amplify that and you choose that you choose like i did rather than going back to living with my stepmother and my dad and feeling shitty about myself excuse me but really hating myself again i went to paris and it was not easy without speaking the language and the the, the modeling business is hard and being objectified as a woman at the age of 18 but I went for it because it had a lot of promise there and so each one of us has opportunities and when we choose that there's a saying that at every moment we hold the the world in our hand the good and the bad and at every moment we get to choose to do something bad so to speak or good and as we do something good the balance changes right and suddenly we have ele we have elevated humanity through a small act of kindness to to someone else but to ourselves as well so that's how we get through these times by creating more and more wonder in our life joy in our life purpose in our life connection community doing good in the world suddenly that's all that shows up in our world and we're elevating the world so more people can go oh i want more of what she has i want more of that that's what i'm looking for too and suddenly the balance has shifted towards goodness more so that's kind of in a very general way um how we go through these times not by ignoring it and saying oh i'm spiritual mm -hmm. all is good in my life no it's by it's by seeing the horror of a shooting in a school and being in pain for that in pain for that and that motivating us in whatever we're doing to do more good however we can do to stop the senseless suffering that has gone on for millennia and that is still going on yes very powerful still um, because yes, because people who walk around, oh, everything's lovely, love and light, uh, light and love, 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 love. Yes, love, but that's frightening. We we are in a balance. You know, the world it sits on an axis. We're balanced. We 
there has to be a bit of good, a bit of bad, everything. That's the light. Everything's light. There is some dark. Yeah. Um, but, you know, speaking of which, I want to let's go back a bit to your your wonderful, fantastic modeling career, because, Anna, I mean, what was it like? You were in Paris. You were a young, beautiful supermodel, really. You modeled for Yves Saint Laurent, Jean-Paul Gaultier. You were on the cover of many different magazines. You did a lot of Vogue Italia, definitely <laughs> Vogue Italia, lots of that. Um, you were walking runways and you did some catalog, Nordstrom and perhaps. Yeah. So you were really working. You were in demand. You were out there. Yeah. I, I, I know looks, everybody's thinking, well, look, but, you know, it's the world. We're, we're visual people, human beings. Yeah, we are. We are. So what was life like for you during that time? What was it like being a model? You know, the, the interesting thing for me in my life is that suddenly life became easy for me because I had been living in such internal constriction. I mean, I was grounded in the summers in from going in the summers in Israel, from going to the beach and the pool because I was a bad student. So I, had, so I was grounded. I had to stay at home for two months in the summer in order to do exams at the end of the summer to pass. So I like I, I I I had a cruel childhood, you know, middle class, so financially safe and and um and abundant, but emotionally really challenged. Mm -hmm. So I had freedom, I had my own money. When I um so 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 it was really this contrast. I could manage my own money, I didn't have to be shamed when I bought a pair of jeans as a as a teenager and my stepmother told me oh it was so expensive or whatever it was and just kind of shamed me for it I could buy four pair of jeans if I wanted so it was really for me it was it was an opening to start to know myself in a different way in in a less cruel really sadistic way if I can say that I grew up in with my stepmother and my dad. So, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sensual person of the senses and I didn't know yet then that I, I'd realized that the material world is an expression of the spiritual world. And so I really enjoyed, I relished Paris is magnificent. Everything there is, everything there is craftsmanship. You make bread, you make a croissant, you make food, you make fashion, you make garden, you make theater, architecture. Everything is done with craftsmanship. So it has to be perfect, but not perfect in a, you know, it has to be perfect in a stressful way, but perfect in honoring the craft. That is spiritual material wholeness. And so I was just enjoying, I was loving the food and I was loving the colors and I was loving the fashion. And so the art, so it, it, it was a beautiful time. Internally, it was hard. The first years I was alone with other models in an apartment. I didn't speak the language. So it had, you know, guys were inappropriate. There wasn't the awareness that there is now. Um, so it had challenges. But I was living in Paris and I was free from my childhood. And that was it. I was on to, and, and so it, it, it was amazing. It was amazing to be, you know, to, to, for Jean Paul Gaultier to say, okay, I want her, her big, you no, know, so I had big red hair. I want that hair. I want her on my show. It was like somebody sees me for a different thing than this bad kid that everything I do is wrong. So that was the internal experience. Suddenly I was like this beautiful redhead with a character, with a smile, with a sense of humor. I mean, people use me mostly because of my personality, the red hair, the fieriness of the personality that came with it. So, so I became well known and, and successful because of that. Yeah, professional. So, um, 
So it was a lot of fun. I did travel the world and it, and, and it was wonderful. And it had, it, it, you know, it had challenges like we all do. Absolutely. But it must have been exciting because the hustle in Boston. For sure. And I've certainly been to fashion shows. I had a brief stint in fashion. So backstage, yeah. it's all go and the models just aren't speaking really because you just have to get in, get out, you get in. And get... Yeah, yeah. Exciting. It's wonderful. And then all yeah. of a sudden, in a minute, it's done. It's over. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then you guys yeah. scurry off to your next one very quickly. Right. Yeah. And, 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 at the same time, it's interesting. I always had a drive in me. It was like I was looking for more meaning and purpose in my life. So I loved it. You, you know, I, I, I wanted, to, I'd always loved Brazilian music. So mm. I wanted to go to Brazil. So a friend of mine who was, who was a photographer got a, um, a catalog job in Brazil. You know, it was not paid that well, but I got to go to Brazil. I got to fulfill a dream. So I, I got to do a lot of things like that, that I wanted to do. And what it gave me is a realization that I can, I can decide that I want to do something and the universe will start organizing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the law of attraction, apropos, is not about just, I want this, I'm dreaming it up, and it's going to happen to me. It's about pr preparing yourself for it to happen if i'm not ready for it to happen it's not going to happen so it, it's taken billions of years to create the planet it takes time for things to manifest but sometimes we're the last ones to show up mm. and so suddenly when we finally go okay i feel that i deserve this enough to show up then it shows up so those are the things that I learned and that I slowly realized, okay, there's a pattern here. There's, there's a principle here. Let me see what the principle is. Let me see how other people can do this as well so that they can also live this enchanted life. Yes. And would you call that synchronicity sort of the offer coming, you being ready for it, you showing up basically and saying, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Because I, as yes. we, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Synchronicity. And as I said earlier, we all get opportunities. I've seen that. I've, I've seen it around me, you know, with family, people who, with, with clients, it's like people, people miss out on opportunities that are there in front of their eyes and they don't take them. And then they say, it's not happening for me. So, so it's happening. You're just wanting to it to just happen. And so so that's a really key part in my new book, Shift Calling. If you don't shift your perception of yourself, you cannot bring upon something new. Barbara Streisand has this beautiful quote. If you want to have something you've never had, you're going to have to do something you've never done. I love it. Mm -hmm. So we all get opportunities, but if we stay constricted, self-hating or self-doubting, it's not that it's that you should just stop it all, but work with your self-doubt. Go and see a coach. Work with someone on your self-doubt, on your self-hatred, on your disbelief in yourself, in your lack of trust, in your trauma. Go and work with it. Don't use it to stay constricted from the flow of energy of the universe of source that is coming through you and giving you an opportunity and then say the world is not work working out for me because that opportunity comes it comes to everyone in different ways with hardships with ease at different times but the opportunities are there and if we don't show up open our heart and do the work that needs to be done and I close my upcoming book, Shift Calling, with how how much I went through in the six months that I wrote the book. I thought I'll just sit and I'd write the book. <laughs> I had to go through my own shifts. The book was going, you better stand behind the words. So I went through some of the hardest things I had to look at in the six months that I wrote the book. But if you do it, wondrous things are coming your way. Amazing. And... 
what are some of your daily practices that help you along the way on a daily basis? Yes. Yeah. So paying attention, looking, paying attention. So for example, we're creating a garden here outside where I'm at. And so there's a lot of, of plants that we bought. And so there was a plant that came in and, and I looked at it and it was like, you know, it's not like so beautiful. And I actually looked at it closely. I said, I'm going to look at this one closely. And suddenly it was like, it has this yellow tiny dots. And for a second, it looks like the stars in the sky. This tiny golden dots inside. And I thought, who created this? Who created such a beautiful flower? So here I was going like, oh, I don't know if I like this flower. To going, no, pay attention, look into it and see. And suddenly it's the most magnificent little flower that is that can bring me in a second into feeling like the stars, the beauty, the universe. Suddenly I was the universe, the universe was me in this little petal or, or flower. And so paying attention is really important because I believe in spiritual material wholeness. Then I am a believer in spirituality that's happening in the world as you're living in the world. So if I'm driving in my car to go to give a talk, I'm driving in my car through the highway, not the most ecstatic experience, but I talk to my car and I say, thank you, because my car is a vehicle for me to live the purpose of my life. It's not just a metal car. It's a vehicle for me living my purpose. Suddenly, I feel elated and I'm driving down the highway. So for me, my practice is really living in the world. Paying attention is one to small things, to, hit, to hidden things and taking a moment to appreciate them as well as looking for the hidden spiritual, emotional qualities in our material world. So, I mean, it, it, it can be what may seem like trivial things. I go to the supermarket and the, and the cart has three compartments, one here, one below, and then, so it has three compartments. And I go, that is so helpful. I can put my vegetables and all my fresh produce up here. I put my dairy stuff here and I'm going to put the dry stuff, the cans I buy here. That makes it so more efficient for me to shop and to pack. Here I'm doing something very mundane, but I'm feeling joy because I'm feeling efficiency. Whole Somebody thought of me as a consumer and wanted to make my life and my shopping experience more delightful mm. and more and having more ease. And so listen to the words. I'm saying more ease, more delight, more efficiency, something care. Someone designed it so I would have a better experience. I'm being loved and cared for. They don't know me, the designer, but they thought of the consumer. Suddenly, we're in this hidden world where a shopping cart in the supermarket can give us all of these qualities. Now I'm walking down the aisle and I'm pretty, I'm, and I'm feeling pretty high on life. Wonderful, that's fantastic. So that's my practice. That's your practice, okay. And and of course, I I stretch and I meditate and I, I I also I I read this magnificent book every day by Eileen Caddy. I I I don't know if you know, Eileen Caddy was one of the co-founders of Findhorn. Findhorn is, the Findhorn Foundation is a spiritual community, an eco-village and an education center in Northern Sc Scotland, where I had my first awakening in 2004, yeah. which changed the direction of my life and my work. And so I read Eileen Caddy's book every day. It's called Opening Doors Within. And I've created, um, in my website, shiftcalling.com, I've created this um, offering where every week I pick one of Eileen's magnificent teachings. So she heard a voice, she actually heard a voice which she identified as 
God's voice, who guided her how to grow spiritually. And so these daily meditations are really amazing practices. And so I take once a week, one of the readings, I create my own meditation exercise. And you can go through that in order to grow spiritually, ground yourself spiritually, grow your vessel so you can bring more of the heavens down to, to earth. And so that's a practice of mine too. Yes, fantastic. And, you know, you do help other people. So can you tell us a bit about what you do offer at times? I know that you're in different right. places. And yeah. So, so, so shiftcalling.com is the website to go to. It's really, it's my sacred virtual home. And um, that's where all my offerings are. So the one I just shared about is called Shifting Within. And it's exercises that you receive once a week based on Eileen Caddy's daily meditation. There's coaching and working with me there personally. Um, That's what I want. I have the coaching. Yeah. So yes. A little so, bit. So, 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 so people can work with me personally on how to shift within. I call the book Shift Calling and not Changing because I think the change is external mm. and shift is internal. So, and in order to effectuate external change, in order to have, we have to shift internally. So as I said before, we have to shift our perception of ourselves. And so you can work with me to do that, to grow yourself so that you have a larger vessel to receive intuitive guidance, love from the universe, um, and live your purpose so you're more connected to your inner being and, and can be the best you can be in whatever field you are, whatever you do, but you are more aligned to your highest self. And so there's different options. There, there's self-paced courses there. You can work with me. You can do the, the uh, guided weekly meditations. And I just keep offering more things. There's free monthly calls. So there's different things there, and, and it's evolving. And it's all at shiftcalling.com. Wonderful. Because that seems to be your calling, really. It sounds like from way back, really. Because even that modeling career was, you were the face for someone. And they had a calling. And it was you. And you showed up. You could have said no yeah. to some of those jobs. but um, And people do sometimes. But you knew. So it sounds like from what I'm hearing so far, today that you have always been in touch now we all ignore sometimes we we get these callings we get these feelings these thoughts these visions and sometimes we ignore them so maybe there's been times you have as well but for sure yeah but for sure and i've paid the price for it i mean we we all do right but go ahead yeah but uh, no, you're you're on the right track. I was just going to ask. So how does that manifest? What happens there? Because in the universe at the moment, a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people. Some people feel as though things just aren't happening for them, and yeah. that, and they can get. But I like what you were saying earlier. You have to show up. Things are yeah. happening around you, and if you look, the at missing you, piece. Yes, go yeah. ahead. The the missing piece is us. We are the missing piece. It's us showing up. And let me tell you, it is, it is, it's always, I, my experience with where I come from, there's some people that things are just easier from, but you've heard enough of my life story that I come from a constricted place of low self-esteem, which I still have inside me. I still have inside me for even, so even to do a TEDx talk. So I have these two parts in me and different people, you know, my astrological chart, might show that I have this very um, low self-esteem and then I have this fiery part who's going to conquer the world. And I have, I live with the, in madness with these two parts. And so even to do a TEDx talk was like, I have a message to share. I'd love to do a TEDx talk. Well, at the time there's only like 20,000 TEDx talks in the world. So it was very exclusive, right? I have to get on a TEDx talk, but I stutter. How am I going to speak in 
how am I going to speak publicly with a stutter? And so I, ha I had to go through a lot to do a TEDx talk. It's easy to say, oh, yes, she, oh, she has a TEDx talk. Easy for her. But internally, it was like I had to listen to that voice that said, you have to do it. Okay, I'll do it. I had to apply three times. The third time I applied for two places, never heard back. Third time, I felt it, it was a match for what they were looking for because they always have a theme. And I went for it and I got it. And then it was like learn by heart because to do a TEDx talk, you have to learn it by heart. Because I, I, I had nine minutes to learn by heart. Nine minutes is a lot. And um, you, you cannot just ramble because you're going to lose your time and there's an audience. Now, I have learning challenges. Learning by heart something is something I cannot do. It's so suddenly I said, what did I get myself into? So I'm just showing you behind the scenes the challenges within, oh, she has a TEDx talk. And I worked with a coach because they now they recommended to work with a coach. Mm -hmm. It cost money. I could have said, oh, I'll just do it on my own. I'm not going to take a coach. I'm not going to spend the money. But I said, no. I said, they're, they're recommending a coach. I want to give myself the best chance. I'll spend the money. Put it on a credit card. Okay. Did that. And she taught me how to do it. He taught me, I, I, I read it out to myself. I recorded it on my phone and I drove in the car and had it on repeat and said it with myself. She taught me how to learn it by heart. And suddenly I mastered it, which in school I could have never done. So you see, th there's always a challenge. It's not like I get the good opportunities, you get the bad ones. We all go for things that are empowering for us and make us feel more whole and purposeful. And there's challenges along the way, but if I don't show up at those times, then either the TEDx talk is not good or it never happens. or So it's all the time living on the edge of creation. And that's what, if I can say, the experiment on this planet is a wondrous experiment. The experiment of planet Earth is can we in the ethers, in the spiritual realms of consciousness that are non-physical, with our capabilities, can we create a wondrous planet? In the can we create separation through the material world without losing the wonder and glory of the spiritual um, non-physical realms? Does that make sense? It does indeed. That, that is the experiment. So everyone, humanity, are all brave souls who have come here to show that it's possible to unite the spiritual and the, and the material and not to devoid the, the, the material world. Like so many classic spiritual teachers are, material things have no value. Here today, gone tomorrow, onto the landfill. No. If you imbue them with your soul, with your heart, with your purpose, whatever you're creating, whatever you're doing, you are bringing godliness into the material world. And that's when they say, let's bring heaven onto earth or the kingdom down. That's what they mean. And that's the human experiment on planet earth. And it's an amazing experiment. And we're all brave souls who have come down to do that. We're all a part of it. Yes. Yeah, what a gift. And life is a gift, I believe. And our listeners, viewers, you will all have your own beliefs. Let us know. Leave us comments. Let us know what you think about our purpose here on the universe. I believe we have many purposes. But as you were saying, this is the Earth's purpose. This is humanity's purpose. And if we choose to accept, if we participate, and um, people who think they're not participating are still participating. Yes. So, you know, even if you're sitting back, that's a participation. It's yeah. Participation yeah. in action. Yeah. Is it physical? Action. Yeah. Yeah. And and I want and I want to say we're each born into into situations mm. where the odds are against us. I mean, let's say say it as it is. If you're a woman. 
if you're black, mm -hmm. if you're LGBTQ, I mean, the, the list goes on. Or even if you're male and you benefit, but you're sent to the army. In Israel, you're sent to the army. My sons who I've loved and cherished and nourished are just going to be fodder for crazy politicians. I mean, we all are born into challenges, into separation from this wholeness of life. And our job is to find, to use the, what we have, what we were born with, to use that to create greater connection, to create more love, to bring wonder, to bring glory, to bring joy. But many of us, the odds are against us. And yet when we do it, we create magic in the world and save people. Yes. Amazing. What's next for you, Anna? I know the book is coming out. It's meant to be out summer this year. Is that still on? Course? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Hopefully in a month. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. Yes. And is there anything else on the horizon? Well, you know, it's really now, it's really spreading the message and helping people really see that there is a bridge to cross and it is possible and the world is not only crumbling it is also being born and if we do this together then we can elevate humanity and our planet so it's spreading the word working with people speaking i also have another book in the making which is going to focus on the expansive principle because i think it is so essential that um, that's probably going to be my next book. That's excellent. No, I think so. That that really resonates a lot. Um, expansion, uh, because a lot of people, you know, we need to come out of this and yeah, do a bit more the the lotus. Yeah, yeah. We we forget that we're spiritual beings. We're nature beings. We're not just human beings. A, a product of our family history and our culture. Yes. And what la last couple of quick questions. Why yes. do you think some of us resonate more with different elements? You know, some people feel, is it astrological? Some people feel affinity to water, air, earth, uh, what the fire, what's that about? You know, like snowflakes, we're each unique. So I'm imagining that, and, and we each have our gift mm -hmm. to bring, and we each have our unique connections to the divine some through water some through earth some through fire um some by working with children some by baking and having a bakery some by making shirts for men i mean we each have different purposes right and so i i think that we each connect um and that's why I think also meditation, it's like unless you meditate and you quiet your mind and you're not spiritual enough, that's not fair because that makes us feel that we're inadequate. You drive down a not so pretty highway in your car and you are thankful for your car for being a vehicle for you to serve the world. You can be high on life and while you're driving a car on the highway and you're connecting because meditation is supposed to be a vehicle to connect us to a more expansive state where we are part of the uh, world. And if you can do it by appreciating your shopping cart at the supermarket or your car when you're driving or anything else that you're doing because you see the hidden qualities that it offers you, then so so then you're doing your spiritual practice in a different way so people do it through connection through reflection through contemplation through meditation through the different elements and you know some of the 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 things like one of the main teachings coming out of um, the Pindhorn foundation where i had my 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 so-called spiritual uh, or, or first awakening yes. was that, that nature has consciousness which means that you can connect to the consciousness of nature and solve ecological problems by communicating with nature. And, you know, native, native people have 
said it way before. So they're just it's like everything has a soul. If you want to, if, if you have a problem on the land, ask the land. The land has what has the land will will answer you. So if you're drawn to water as your healing medium, then speak to water. The 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 the, the, the water um, elements have consciousness and you can communicate with them. And that is, is my third principle of physical, non-physical synergy. So speak to water if water is the way that you heal best or can help best. Or speak to fire if fire is your element. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's astrology, there's karma, there's who we are, but the world is alive. Yes, and it's not uh, singular. We are multidimensional. Imagine if we were one dimension. Is isn't that the name of a singing group? Uh, but yes, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, I think it is. A, yeah. So, but imagine if we were one dimension. Yeah, we have many dimensions, and yes, and and I don't believe when we leave the physical that that's it. Uh, yes always connecting and always still there and i agree with you yeah now, lastly you are a philanthropist because you support wild.org so yes why is wild? Well, well we've just been talking about why but why do you yes well um the mission of wild is to for there to be enough of a balance of wilderness on the planet uh, in order to have balance <clears throat> because it's in the wilderness that the, the the wholeness is more palpable and nature can thrive and humanity needs qualities that are in the wilderness right you go to a spectacular um, place in nature and you connect to vastness that expands your consciousness you connect to peacefulness, that connects you to peacefulness. If you don't have nature around you, then you have to produce that within the human world. So now you have to be in midtown Manhattan with all the neon lights and the traffic and you need to create peacefulness, that's harder. But if you go to this magnificent ocean or you go to a garden or to the wilderness you can find peacefulness it's more palpable there because nature is emanating it and so both from a spiritual perspective we need nature in order because it balances and reminds us of our spiritual nature so we're, we're not anxious in the human world but we feel we're part of this loving wondrous wholeness but also nature so the natural elements they need it habitat so it's more of a natural wilderness creates more of a wholeness of the optimal conditions of living on planet earth and so that's what the wild foundation does mm -hmm. and so um i when you think there's so many causes to serve i feel that that is at the basis it's just like saving trees feels at the basis. If we don't have trees, if we don't have the the forests on our planet, the lungs of the planet are gone. You don't have lungs, you cannot breathe. So I'm I'm thinking, okay, what are the the basics that we need? Um, and so that why that's why Wild is is um, is a is a nonprofit that I think does amazing work. Excellent. Well, the link is in the show notes, guys, if you want to support Wild. It's wild.org. And um, you can donate, you can support in any way you can. Uh, and so, Anna, I this has been fantastic. I've learned so much. And uh, I just want to thank you for sharing all of your thoughts, your wisdom, your words with the world. And we're going to look forward to this book this summer. I have had so much fun. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'll say, because 
you know, the, the tables have been, you've been asking me questions, but when we're off, I would love to experience your wisdom, your channeling, um, and, and, and because I can feel, you know, the presence that you hold. So we'll talk about that later, but I definitely want to check your services. Without your doubt. offerings. I'm, I'm happy to, happy to. But thank you. And viewers, please go and follow Anna. All her social media will be there. And have a look at her website as well, because the courses are fantastic. And it doesn't matter what stage you're in, in your spiritual development, your human learning. It doesn't matter. You know, there's all these phrases about transcending or, you know, that person's not alive enough or awake enough. It doesn't matter. Put all that aside. And if you feel that you're in the space to grow, if you feel you want to expand, um, join one of Anna's courses. And I think that will be a really good place to start. So and that is at shiftcalling.com. And let me just say the two choices you have is to stay stuck and feel terrible or to grow a bit scary but to grow and then be in a different place you decide you decide yes and that's <laughs> the thing because we're all responsible for those decisions and you decide yeah um, but Anna, just, there's nothing left to say but thank you thank you thank you sending lots of loving blessings to you and i hope you come back especially when the book comes out we'll have to get you on with it. pleasure with pleasure it's been a pleasure Thank you so much. Huh? Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.